Hello, welcome to Leading Lights. I'm Greg Donaldson. Have you ever gone off track when you've been driving in a car and had a GPS with you? I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but let me explain to you. I use a GPS. And when I'm traveling somewhere where I'm, I'm not familiar with the place, I put into it my destination and the GPS navigates a path for me. And as I'm driving, it says turn left at the next road or go through this intersection or stay to the right or whatever it is. And the GPS tells me where to go. But at times I go the wrong way. I know it's silly, but sometimes I do. Sometimes it says turn left and I wasn't concentrating or I was confused and I miss it. And especially if I'm on a freeway, sometimes I'll end up miles away from where I was supposed to be. And in the old days, before GPS's, before uh, these electronic ways of tracking, I would have tried to look at a map, I would have stopped and asked somebody for directions, or I would have tried to retrace my steps. I would have tried to turn around, do a U-turn, and go back to where I left the path. And in Christian circles, I have been advised of this in the past. Have you ever had this advice where you've gone to somebody and you've said, I think I'm out of God's will. I think I've missed the track, the path that God wanted for me. And that person says to you, go back, retrace your steps to the last time you knew when you were in God's will and get back on that path and start again. And that makes sense. And I can see how that is helpful if you can retrace your steps. But there are times in my life where I have gone so far off track that I have crossed various obstacles, rivers, bridges. I have gone through various checkpoints in my life and it's impossible for me to get back. Have you ever been there? You know, King David did this. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, David had been the king of Israel for many years and he was a successful king. He was a man after God's own heart. He had served God faithfully. He had done great things for God and he sinned. He saw a woman who was not his wife. He desired her, lusted after her, took her. Not sure if it was by force, but anyway, he, he slept with her. And then because she became pregnant, he tried to cover up his sin by killing her husband. And he married her and the child was born that had resulted from this sin and the child died. Now, David has gone off track. It's like he's going in one direction for God and he knows where God wants him to go. If you read the Psalms and first and second Samuel and various parts of the Bible, we get such a, a wonderful picture of David's heart for God. He knew what God wanted. He, he wanted to be in the house of the Lord. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. The Lord's my shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness. These are David's words. He knew what it was to have the sat nav voice of God saying, yes, my son, you're on the right track. It wasn't a sat nav. It was a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He guides me, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, when there's terrible opposition and enemies and tragedy, I know that God is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. For many years, decades even, David had been following the sat nav, the GPS, and God had been taking him the right way. And something happened where he went off track. He took a wrong turn. But what I want you to see is that the decisions that he made were so drastic that it was impossible for him to retrace his steps to where he had been. He couldn't bring Bathsheba's husband Uriah back to life. He could say sorry. He could confess to the nation. He could confess to Bathsheba and to others. He could say sorry to God, which is what he did in Psalm 51. We have a record of David's 
prayer of repentance where he says, sorry, God, I've missed the mark. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. But what I want you to see is that in the physical world, there were practical things that he had done that he could not undo. He had married a woman, Bathsheba. Is he supposed to divorce her? Uh, he had made decisions which were irreversible. And it was possible for David to get to a place where he said, I've gone so far off track. I can't get back. I can say sorry, but I can't get back. Therefore, I am disqualified from now on. But I want you to know that David pressed a button on his GPS with God and it recalculated his route from where he was to take him to God's best plan for him without him having to retrace his steps. He retraced as best he could. In 2 Samuel 12 and 13, we see David's repentance. He fasts and he prays and, and he repents and he humbles himself. He says, sorry. And the prophet of God, Nathan, says, you are forgiven, but there will be consequences. The child will die and various consequences will happen. I don't believe that was God punishing him. I believe that was just God saying, you've gone so far off track. There will be a rocky road for you to get back to where you need to be. There are consequences, but I want you to see that God can recalculate your route with him from wherever you are. There is nowhere that is too far from God's plan, that he can't recalculate a route for you to get back to where he wants you to be. And in fact, this is the message that I'm wanting to give you today, is that throughout the Bible, God recalculates people's roots from where they are. Let me put it another way. God uses broken, messed up people, sinful situations, damaged and destroyed situations. He uses those. He redeems them. That's the Bible word for recalculate. He redeems. In other words, he takes something broken, he washes it, and he uses it in its brokenness, and he gets glory out of it. And the, the person who turns back to him is taken on God's path from their place of sin, of wandering, of error, of brokenness. God will use broken and messed up people. And in fact, every single person in the Bible that I know of that was used by God, except for Jesus and Daniel, those are the only two that I know of no sin that they committed. But every other person in the Bible was broken. Every other person had gone off track. God recalculated, or to use his word, he redeemed, he bought back, he, he used brokenness to get glory for himself. And the message for you today, my friend, is God can recalculate your route back from now, wherever you happen to be. You know what's amazing about the story of David is in the New Testament, it gives the genealogy of Jesus. And it says all of his ancestors, and it names all the people that were used by God in, in the lineage that brought the Messiah, God's perfect son, to planet Earth. And Bathsheba is in that list. Bathsheba was one of the people that God used. God used a sinful relationship that should never have happened. And he redeemed it and he used it to bring his perfect gift to planet Earth. Friend, I want to say to you, it doesn't matter how broken you are. It doesn't matter how far you've wandered off the track. It doesn't matter how desperate your situation looks and you think there's no way back. There's no redemption for this. There's no way God can use this terrible situation that I've created or that others have created for his glory. And I want to tell you, God is in the miracle business. In fact, he loves to take situations that look impossible, that look beyond redemption, and he redeems them and he uses them. I want to tell you another story. It's the story of Moses. Moses was born as a Hebrew, as one of God's people, and they were in slavery to Egypt, and they'd been there for hundreds of years, and Moses is born, and the devil tries to kill him, 
using Pharaoh. He says, kill all the male children. And Moses is, is miraculously rescued. And Moses is brought up. He's adopted by one of Pharaoh's daughters. And he's brought up as a prince in Pharaoh's palace. The most amazing story. So there's this Hebrew and the Egyptians have wanted to kill all the male boys, but they end up bringing up one of those little Hebrew boys as a prince in Pharaoh's household, like an adopted son of Pharaoh's. Isn't that amazing? And you know that the symbol of the Pharaoh was a stick with a snake's head on the top. Do you know that? Or sometimes they had it on a, on a crown or a, a, a headdress that they wore. It was a, a, an upright snake and that represented their gods and their power and their right to rule because the pharaohs thought they were like gods. And so there's this Hebrew boy who has a sense in his heart that he is supposed to help his people and set them free from slavery. But he's walking around with this stick with a snake's head on the top and all the pomp and ceremony of being an Egyptian prince. And one day when he's about 40 years old, he sees a Hebrew being mistreated by some Egyptians and he tries to stop them and he ends up killing the Egyptian and hiding the body and people hear about it and he has to flee from Egypt. And when, when he killed the Egyptian, it was like he was sensing he's supposed to deliver his people, but he was doing it in his own strength. He was doing it in his own way. He kind of had the right motives, but he messed up. He sinned. He blew it. Capital offense, murder. And the Pharaoh hears about it. He says, you have killed somebody. And the only thing that Moses can do is run away. He has to drop his stick. He has to take off his pomp and ceremony and all his wonderful garments. He has to leave his position, his home, his family, his friends, and he flees out of Egypt into the wilderness, into the desert. And for 40 years, he is wandering around in the wilderness in obscurity. He's married to a lady called Zipporah and he gets taken in by a Bedouin tribe and he looks after their sheep. And for 40 years, can you just let that sink in for a moment? For 40 years, he is wandering around aimlessly in his heart. He's thinking, you know what? I was supposed to be a great leader. I was supposed to set my people free. I was supposed to be this great deliverer that God was going to use. He saved me as a little baby and he protected me and I blew it. And now I'm nowhere and I can do nothing. I'm forgotten. God has forgotten me. Can you imagine that scene? It's a bit like being on a road with your GPS system telling you you've gone the wrong way. But there was a recalculating moment. God redeemed the situation in Exodus chapter three. I'm going to just read it to you. It says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father in law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. Moses had a choice. He could have just kept on going, driving his car, if you like, without recalculating. But he sensed there was something more here. He pressed the recalculate button. He, he wanted to find out what God was doing. He sensed there was something of God in this. And he said, I will turn aside and see why this, this bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And God recommissions Moses. He's 80 years old now. 
He has been wandering for half of his life in obscurity and self-condemnation, thinking that he's blown it. And God calls him and says, I want you to set my people free. And Moses says, I can't. I can't speak properly. I can't do this. I can't. I can't. I can't. And God gets a little bit angry with him. He says, who made your mouth? I will give you the power. I will be with you and I will give you the strength. But I want you to just see one thing. The stick that Moses had as a pharaoh or as a prince of a pharaoh was this straight, polished, golden stick with a lovely snake head on the top. And that represented him trusting in his own strength. But now he carries a stick that is a bent, crooked stick. Um, we know that it's an almond stick because later on it blossoms and buds and produces almonds. But it was just a stick, a dry, dead stick that he'd found in the desert, probably just lying around there with a hundred other sticks like it. It was, it was just discarded, a bit like Moses. He became a discarded, useless stick, but he picked it up and he took it into God's presence. And in Exodus chapter 4, uh, verse 1, Moses said, suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. And the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a rod or a stick. And he said, cast it to the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand, take it by the tail. He reached out his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And he gave him other signs and wonders. And this stick that was just discarded and useless became something awesome. In fact, it's called the rod of God. L look at verse 20. It says, Then Moses took his wife and his sons and he set them on a donkey and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Can you see what's happened here? God has taken a discarded stick that was just waste material and he's turned it into the rod of God. And God has taken Moses, who was a discarded person who had condemned himself and thought he was forgotten and turned him into the rod of God, the instrument of God. And Moses takes the stick and he does miracles in Pharaoh's court. When he confronts Pharaoh and says, set my people free, the, the stick, the rod of God, this broken piece of almond wood gets used to turn into snakes, to make the Nile turn to blood, to do miracles. When he's crossing the Red Sea, he stretches out the stick and the Red Sea parts. When he needs water in the desert, he strikes a rock and water comes out of it with the stick. When he's fighting the Amalekites, he holds up the stick and they win the war. And all through, right to the end, just before they come into the promised land, the people rebel against Moses and God says, put your stick and everyone put their sticks in my presence. And the person I've chosen, his stick will blossom and bud. And Moses' stick blossoms and buds and there's leaves and almonds and fruit coming off it. And God says, this is my leader. And I want you to see that God takes something that is discarded and that the world says is beyond redemption and he turns it into the rod of God. But the only difference is Moses turned aside to look. He said, I'm going to believe and hope and trust that maybe there's a second chance for me. He listened to God. He believed God's words. He put himself in God's hands. He gave his stick to God, himself to God, and then he obeyed and he followed God. Friend, you can do that today. You can press the recalculate button wherever you are in your life. God can use you. Even if you see yourself as a discarded piece of driftwood, God says, I can make you something beautiful, but it's not because of your strength. It's because I'm the God who recalculates, who redeems, and God will do it today. I've got one more story. It's the story of Jacob in Genesis chapter 28. And verse 11, it says, So Jacob came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on earth. 
and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Jacob, at this point in his life, has just left his family. He's been kicked out of his family. You know, Jacob was a twin and his twin brother Esau, who was slightly older than him by a few minutes, deserved the birthright of being the oldest son. And his father, Isaac wanted to give Esau the birthright, but Jacob deceived his father and he deceived his brother and he stole the birthright. And when they found out about it, they were angry and his brother wanted to kill him. And his father and mother said, you better go away, go and find a wife in some faraway land because it's not safe for you to be here. And Jacob leaves his family and his home for the first time in his life. He is rejected. He is excluded. He's deceived and hurt the people closest to him. And he's all alone and he finds a place to sleep. It says in verse 11, he came to a certain place. He didn't even know where it was. It was just in the middle of nowhere. He had no bed to sleep on. He just found a rock and he lay down on it and God broke in to his life and showed him that wherever you are, and friends, I'm talking to you right now, wherever you are, and I'm not just talking about geographically wherever you are, I'm talking about spiritually, emotionally, no, no matter whose life you've messed up, no matter how much you've messed up your own life, no matter how much you've sinned, no matter how much you've alienated yourself from other people, wherever you are, that can be the gateway to heaven for you. Because God is right there with you right now. He's just asking you to open your eyes and your heart and say, God, I believe you're here. I believe this is the point where I can start recalculating my route instead of going away from you back to where you want me to be. You know, the place was called Luz and Jacob renamed it Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. But Luz means almond stick, which is very interesting. It's the same as Moses' stick, but it also means uh, crooked or, or, or bent or perverse. And that's what, that's what Jacob was. He, was. he was nothing. He had no relationship with God, even though he'd been brought up in, in a godly family. He had rejected his family's advice. He'd done everything wrong. He'd deceived and tricked everybody. He'd stolen and he had no relationship with God. But no matter how far he was from God, in the middle of nowhere, in a forgotten place called Luz, God says, this can be the house of God. If you will just dedicate yourself to me, look at all the plans I have. And God lays out the route, the recalculated route. He says, I'll bless you. I'll bring you back to this place. I'll give you descendants. I'll look after you. I'll protect you. All the earth will be blessed through you. And I want to say to you, my dear friend, God has laid out a route for you in his word. You remember David said, the Lord's my shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness. God has paths of righteousness laid out in his word. Ephesians 2 says, God has prepared good works for you to do in advance. He already has thought of all the good things he wants for you. And he's waiting for you to say, God, I want to press the recalculate button. God, I want to get my life back on track with you. God, I need you as my GPS in my life 
speaking to me and saying, this is the way, walk in it. You know, the Bible says God will guide you with his eye. He will show you the way. And if you turn to the left or to the right, he will say, this is the way, walk in it. When you have God as your GPS in your life, when you've dedicated your life to him and say, God, I want to serve you. He is speaking. He is guiding. He is nudging you. He is helping you. He's even using the mistakes and the mess of your past and turning it around for good in your life so that you can become more like Jesus, so that you can serve God's purpose in your generation and so that you can make it to heaven at the end of your life. Do you want that? Do you want God's GPS, which stands for God's plan starts now? Do you want God's plan to start GPS in your life? If you do, I'm going to ask you to press the recalculate button, the redeem button, and pray with me now. Say, God, I feel just like Jacob. I'm in a place I don't know how I got here. I'm feeling like my past is painful. God, I'm feeling like my mistakes have broken my life and broken other people's lives. I feel like I'm beyond redemption, but I ask you, God, to redeem me, to forgive me, to clean me, and to take my mess and take this bent, crooked stick that my life is and turn it into something beautiful that you can use. God, I give my life to you now. I receive your forgiveness. I thank you that your word says, if I confess my sins, you are faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I receive your cleansing and I thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, please get in touch with us. Go to leadinglightsnetwork.com. Use the contact page, sign up, email us, phone us, whatever it is. Let us know what's going on in your life because we would love to partner with you in this journey that God's got for you. God bless you. How do I tell my friends and neighbors about Jesus? How can I do more for God? Have you considered starting a small meeting where you discuss the Bible and talk about God? You just need to invite a couple of people and show them God's love. Leading Lights will help you with the rest. We have free resources, prayer teams and seasoned church leaders who want to help you do great things for the Lord. Visit leadinglightsnetwork.com or download the Leading Lights app from all app stores.